más, más, Netflix. Gas mask and hand grenades. <laughs>
I go back and I do want to do that a little bit with you. So if you'll allow me to, but I also think that it might be a cool place to start with the fact that Solitude Eternus played their first live show in over 13 years, two weeks ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Down there in Houston, you know, Houston. Hell's Heroes. Hell's Heroes, babe. How, how the hell did that come about? I know Christian. I had Christian on. Super cool dude. Great guy. Puts on a hell of a fest down there. But I know he's been asking John forever to do it. Yeah, I mean, uh, to my knowledge, I know, uh, you know, from John that uh, you know, he told me, he said, man, he said, Christian's been asking, you know. And, you know, I didn't think we were there or whatnot. Well, you know, the rest of us didn't know about this. But uh, so, yeah, basically, you know, to cut to the chase, I think it was last last year father's day because i was at my daughter's john calls he says hey you want to do some essay i said okay where what <laughs> it was that simple man <laughs> where yeah there so yeah that's that's about all i know so uh apparently christian's been asking and this was the time though this felt right and and you know i you know pieces pieces kind of fell into place but uh you know like we're gonna do this we're gonna, i'm gonna call cub you know call lyle see what's up see if we can find Edgar. And it just came together, man. It was like, there was no issues, you know? It was like so, super solid. Well, have, in that 13-year absence, though, am I going to take it that there's never been offers? I, I can't believe that. There has to have been a lot of offers. Oh, no, no, no. There, there's been offers. I mean, you know, I, I it, it tears at my soul that we haven't taken every one of them. And I mean that. It, it just does, but. You know, life happens, right? You know, I, right. me, I've been all over the place. I've lived in Stockholm. I've lived in Amsterdam. I've lived in Phoenix. I've lived in Minnesota, you know, back in Texas. Ding, ding, ding. And, you know, the other guys, you know, you know, you know, when life happens, you move up. Somebody had a kid. Somebody did this. Somebody got divorced. Somebody moved over here. And um, you just keep trucking. So just it, it just never felt like the things were copacetic to making it happen. Is that sort of the deal? I'm I'm pretty sure that had something come up at any time during that little bubble, mm -hmm. yeah, it would have been it, it would have been feasible. It would have been definitely considered. But like I said, this just kind of came out of the blue, and it just worked for everybody. So I think probably good that it didn't happen. Then. It, it happened when it was supposed to happen. How did it feel going out on stage again after so long? And now you're a three, you're a six piece at this point, right? You've had you've got yeah, we got guitar players. Right? I mean, Mosley's been a big part of SA. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he's been a big part of the, our, our our group from from way back. Uh, you know, he played on Adagio. You know, he was bass player on Adagio, and then switched over to guitar. So he's been around. He's part of the band. I mean, Mosley is part of the band. So, you know, we had we had to make that happen. But do, do you want to do you want to run down quick who all the the players were? There was obviously you and John. Who else was on well, stage? Well, you know, it was myself, uh, John Perez, Lyle Stedham, or the Count, uh, Covington, yeah. the Wolf. Uh, we had Edgar Rivera and uh, Steve Mosley on guitar. So it was the originals, originals, and originals. You know, I mean, Steve, right, right. you know, it was it was the originals. You know. So how did it feel, man? Like I just well, you know, what's funny about the originals because actually uh, Stedham, the Count used to uh play drums for sa oh really when i joined lyle was sitting on the kit wow so, so we have original 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 we have you know cub or lyle on drums then the bass then cub on drums mostly was on bass and then mostly on guitar so you know it's we just oh. kind of all the bases are covered, right? Completely, <laughs> and then some. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Now, how much rehearsals did you guys put in to get prepped for the show? Uh, I'm gonna say, and you got asking me questions. Huh? Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm gonna say maybe six, eight, a couple of weekends a month. Yeah. When did we start? Yeah. Eight at least. You know, Saturday, Sunday, a couple of weeks, Saturday, Sunday, a couple of weeks, Saturday, Sunday. I'm going to say uh, 8, 12. Yeah. And was you guys are all 
are you all pretty much centrally located in the Dallas area or no? Well, at this, at, well, see, that's another thing. At this yeah. moment, we are. Because right now, at this moment, I'm, I'm here in Texas. Uh, Covington lives up in Ohio. Uh, Cincinnati? Cincinnati? Okay. Thanks, Cincinnati. So he, he, we flew him in for the weekends that we uh, put this together. So, but basically, everybody's central. We're not as spread out as we were a few years back. So mm -hmm. that, that did help quite a bit. But we flew Cub in for the weekends and just knocked it out. Best we could. How how did it feel? Because I watched, you know, some you know YouTube, but you know this now. You're up on stage. There's nine thousand cameras in the air, right? Which is is weird, right? Because when you and I went to shows back in the day, that shit wasn't yeah, there. That's what you put up, man. Put your lighter up, exactly, right? Yeah. yeah. After you smoked your joint or your bowl, you then you put your lighter up, right? Yeah. But. I'm wondering, like, you burn the hell out of your finger. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> kind of weird. When you're stoned, you don't need, seem to mind it as much. You're stoned mm -hmm. or drunk. I was usually stoned or drunk. It is the scene that hold it. But what, um, what was it like looking out in that sea of people? Because from what I gathered, again, I wasn't there, but I talked to many friends that went and people that I knew, people I ran into. I was at the Boy Vod show last yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Boy Vod. And I was wearing a forbidden shirt and a dude walked up. He's like, dude, man, do you know they're back together? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I kind of do. I know Craig. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I do. I kind of know they're back together. They just played. It. He's like, yeah, man, I just got in from hells. I'm like, wait, you went to that whole weekend show and now you're over here. At Boy, Vod. I'm like, man, you're a warrior, dude. That's four right. straight days. That's hard. Right. But he yeah. said, he basically said, that Forbidden, Queensryche, and Solitude were the, the three bands that wrecked everybody. And and I watched the, the YouTube footage. I watched a couple different good shows. Man, it was just, first of all, you look great, dude. You look like you're in great shape right now. You sound you. fucking awesome. And yeah, the, appreciate that. the band sounded really, really like on it, man. And it was like, but how was it for you guys to be in there? Was Were you nervous? Was there a little nerves going out? Uh well, I, you know, I can only speak for myself when it comes to was, was there nerves on the stage or not? I mean, you know, honestly, I really haven't stopped doing things, you know. Right. Of course. We'll so get it. that, uh, yeah, we'll get into that. But I, you know, it's that, that old, you know, cliche. It's like, you know, it's like we have always been together. I mean, like from, from day one, you know, when we first met for the first rehearsal, we're cutting up and, you know, kicking each other in the balls and just like we never left, you know, it was uh, just hadn't changed a bit. And we got in there and Cub got behind the kit and I think we cranked off with, I think we just cranked off, said fuck it and went straight into uh, Opaque. <laughs> it was like, there it is, you know. I mean, obviously we had to tweak a few things, you know, but right, uh, right. it just, it felt natural. It just like, like it had never been sitting on the shelf for a while. Did were all the tunes i mean it, it, i don't honestly i should know this as a guitar player but i don't uh, you does um do you guys tune tune down to are you in d or yeah it's, it starts in d okay yeah. and then we drop tune for like ninth day and a couple other songs that we didn't play that day so we it starts in d and then gets to doomier from there but it your voice man d. D is for Doom, right? You know, right, D is for Doom. Yeah, yeah. I should have put that together, man. See, I'm getting old. I can't put these things together like as yes, quickly, right? Right. Um, I, so, I mean, your voice sounded fantastic, man. You just sounded like you were, again, you sounded like you were really in shape, like you were really primed for this, and the audience seemed very receptive as well. It was, I mean, were you feeling those vibes? Were you really feeling like the love? Yeah, I definitely was feeling the love, you know, uh, and, and it was extremely nice to see all the people, all the fans, all the hardcore fans that have been around forever, new fans. Young uh, kids, younger kids. Kids, right? You know, that's yeah. a nice thing to see, too, because right. well, dad's going, dude, you got to listen to this, right? Yeah. There you go. If you're going to ride in my car, this is what you're going to hear. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're going, you're going with me to Hell's Heroes, yeah. kid. That's you're how going it's with me, man. Yeah. But, uh yeah, it was really nice. It uh, the reception was was amazing. Um, 
you know, just getting there. You know, it, fuck, I don't know what to expect. Nobody knew what to expect. We just got there. Yeah. All right, well, we did what we could. We rehearsed, got together, you know, had some powwows and got there. And it was just like I said, it just felt, I hate to use the word routine because that sounds lackadaisical. Right. It's far from that. But it was just, you know, we were there and doing our thing, you know, and getting geared up and getting out there. And just to see all those people, it was like, oh, man, you love me. You really love me. You know, <laughs> there was like, right, there, right. I expected at least 10 people. I, you know, I was, I was pushing the envelope with that one. You were hoping for 10. I was hoping for 10. I would have been happy with five. But you got a few more than that. I think you got yeah, about what? Yeah. Did they know what the, the attendance was? Was it about 3,500, somewhere in that range? Three, I'm going to go ahead and give you that because I kept hearing, 3K, you know, plus or minus. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'd shoot for right about 3K on that one. What, um, were you guys in for the whole fest? Did you just stick around for the day, or did you come in and stick around? We all came down. Uh, we drove down on Thursday, because we all live up here in the Dallas right. Fort area, right? So we drove down on Thursday, got there Thursday late afternoon, got our hotels and shit, maybe had something to eat, and then we all went out to the fest to hang and obviously see Candlemas that night, you know, so. Yeah. Went and saw, saw good old C-Mass and hung out. And yeah, how was that? How, how was that? Huh? How was that for you? I was, it's fucking great, man. Yes, <laughs> fuck, yeah. Yeah. fuck yeah, man. Now, had you cool. seen those guys recently? Like when they pass through Dallas, you, you go to the show and hang out or, or how's that? No, I haven't. I haven't seen those guys since back when, at all. Like 2012, when you left the band. Yeah, 2012. Wow, no shit. Now, I mean, we've had words via right. this magic internet stuff, right? Right. And, right. Uh, but other than that, yeah, the last time I saw, when the hell was the last time I played? I think the last show I did with those guys was in Portugal. No, 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 I lied. Uh, Seventy thousand tons of metal. Okay, that was that was the last show. Was that for Psalms of the Dead? Probably that tour, right? Yeah, yeah, that was all part of that package. Yeah, because we did Portugal, and I came back to the states, and then we yeah, down to flew down to Florida. Oh no, no, I flew from Stockholm to Florida. Jesus Christ! Anyway, something like that. Were but you so living there, when you were with Candlemass? You were living there for a while. Yeah, when uh we did the last album, I was uh I was in Stockholm. Okay. I was living in Stockholm at that time. And then that's right. And then we did all that, did a few things. And then I went from Stockholm, Florida, and then from Florida, came back to Texas. Okay. After, after right. I got off the boat. But you're a Texas boy, right? You're born and bred there? Dallas area or? Yeah, North Texas. Uh, yeah, not the, well, yeah, North Texas. It's about an hour and a half north. Grew up in a town called Boyd, Texas. Okay. When I grew up, I think it was a population of 535, you know. Okay, barely, real small, yeah. We didn't even have a traffic light. Didn't even have our own cops. We had to rely on the highway patrol for all of Wise County. Yeah, a little small, small. No county. way, really. No kidding, no man. Shit, man. Now, see, when I lived in Texas, it would have been 76 to 80. My dad moved down there. My stepdad moved down there for a job with what was called Brown and Root, which became Halliburton, you know. the. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Brown and Root. I used to work in a machine shop when I was a kid, and we used to do parts for those guys. Yeah, no kidding. How about that? Yeah, so I lived in Spring, Spring, Texas. Spring. Spring. I lived in Spring. No about, way. For uh, real? Yeah, no shit. Uh, I'm going to say, yeah, 2013 through almost 15, I lived in Spring. Is the cafe still there by the railroad tracks, the Spring the Cafe? What? The cafe, Spring Cafe, the little cafe yeah. by the railroad tracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, shit, South man! Texas. I lived in Lexington. I, I lived in, in the woodlands for a while, so I lived in the woodlands for also. Oh, okay. Well, that was right down. I lived in Lexington Woods. Okay, I'm Isn't not that crazy, crazy that, huh? That's crazy, man. How about it's, that? It's all kind of jammed up right there, but yeah, yeah, it did. It, it hesitated for. Yeah, I, I lived in Lexington Woods. We okay. moved down there with my stepdad, and like I said, that was kind of a very We'll, we'll segue into to young Robert Lowe here for a minute. Um, uh, when I lived down there, and this was, you know, I was born in 66, so I was already about 10. And like I said, I was a Yankee transplant. 
you go. Believe you me, man, those Texas boys did not let me forget that. Oh, you you don't hear about it. I get I get a goddamn ticket, man. There ain't no way you're getting away from that. Oh, no <laughs> way. It was like the Yankee. Look at the Yankee over there with a long hair. Yippee. <laughs> <laughs> yippee, yeah, exactly. A yippee. But yeah, we um, you know, my first concert was Kiss at the Spectrum down there, which I think is like a church now or something weird like that. Yeah, one of them big old, old mega churches. Yeah. yeah, mega church. Yeah. So, what? When did you live there? What? What you? In Texas, I was down, I was down in that area. Uh, early thirteen, early fifteen. Okay, so fairly more recently then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not back then. I loved it down there, man. I, I was the one guy of the family that did not want to move, but my mom just couldn't. She couldn't hang. She wanted to come yeah, back north. Back home, huh? family and her mother was getting older and father had cancer it was like she wanted to come home and but i dug it man because it was like the only thing i didn't dig that i didn't fill in on which you maybe didn't either was i never got into the country and western thing or the cowboy hat wearing thing i was i was still a yankee in that you know i wore my i wore my shirts and my my, right, my right. ripped up jeans and wow. i had long ass hair you know yeah when i was a teen I was maiden, you know, I'm trying to yeah. grow my hair, you know, <laughs> got my Saxon shirt on the one that oh, comes yeah. on those sleeves, you know, hell yeah, <laughs> man. Glory. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, but grew up on, a, I don't want to say farm, but we had cattle, horses. Oh, Chicken. did you really? Yeah. Fuck yeah. I had oh, to yeah. get up and I'd, uh, bottle feed calves, man, before I went to school. I mean, that sounds like such a country story. I was like, that was like the 4-H shit, right? The 4-H club. Well, yeah, cool. but yeah. I wasn't part of the 4-H. I mean, okay, I you were doing it for that, real. I still had to do shit at the house. You, yeah, know? you were doing it for real, living at, yeah, at the house. Right? I, didn't know, I ain't getting no sticker. I'm out. This for real. Are you Are you my my age or older or younger? If you might, yeah, we're in that might. area. We're in that area? That's what I thought, yeah. Um, yeah, it was cool, man. I mean, you know, I remember, like, going down there and, you know, I, I guess so – what was young Robert Lowe listening to as a kid before he became a teen that then led to the heavier stuff? Like for me, my mom was not a Beatles. She was a, a James Taylor, a Carol King, a Simon and Garfunkel. Those were my first bands I, I heard or first music I heard. So right. more like the AOR of the time or the ra the AM radio stuff. Yeah. But then, then my neighbors, when we moved back to PA, or before we moved to Texas, my neighbors were listening to Led Zeppelin IV, Aqualung, uh, Cheech and Chong, you know, that kind of shit like that, you know. And and then the biggie right before I left, right before I left to go to Texas was Kiss. And yes. Alive, Alive was the album that was like, okay, that's the formative album. But the first album I bought with my own money was rock and roll over when we moved to Texas, hence the Kiss thing being my first band. So, how about you? Give me, give me a rundown on sort of your. Well, uh, my parents are really cool. Um, I remember as a kid, every Saturday, that's when they cleaned house, right? So, clean house on Saturday, and they had the the hi fi system in the in the living room there, right? And they were always playing. I'm just going to throw shit out there that I remember, you know, it's like kind of what got me started. Like, uh, obviously they had the Beatles on, uh, they had, the uh, Jimi Hendrix, are you experienced with spinning, you know, the Trogs, you know, wild thing, Oh yeah, wild the thing. Raiders, yeah. you know, just yeah. let me see to you. Uh, and, uh, what else was going on? I remember those, you know, mom would listen to like, you know, Sonny and Cher. I mean, yeah. it was all over the board, but, there was a lot of, I guess you would say, metal going on in that house. So, I mean, come on. Are you experienced? Listen to that album. You know? <laughs> very metal. Very metal. I'm spinning. I'm a little yeah. five-year-old running around. And that's what I'm, you know, that's what I'm hearing. And you got the Beatles. And then you have, you know, the Trogs and, and Sonny and Cher. You know, i trying to remember what else they might have listened to. I still have, I still have those albums that my parents had, you know. Well, like on the, on the radio a lot, like I very distinctly remember a couple songs, man. Big old jet airliner from Steve Miller band, right? I was gonna, I was gonna get to that, right? Yep, yeah, Jungle yeah. Love, right? You know, and, yeah. and Abba, all, Dancing Queen, and 
well, that see, yeah, that was yeah, I love that shit. Too. I still love that stuff. I, I don't yeah, know. I'm, I, I like me some Abba. Yeah. But yeah, you got to talk about it. You're talking about the 70s um, formative years. You know, whatever the radio, you know, I was hearing some Ted, you know, I'm hearing uh, Jesus Christ, you know. Double obviously. Live Gonzo, right? Double Live Gonzo. Yeah. Hearing that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, Jerry Rafferty, you know, just all kinds of stuff. And Baker Street. Yeah, that's a great song, man. It's still oh, a great song. Yeah, you can't amazing. Beat it. It's got a, it's got a feeling. It's got a vibe. Yeah. Well, you know, we were lucky to hear that a lot of the '70s music is just class A stuff, man. It's so beat. good. Yeah, yeah, it's class. Solid. It's solid rock and roll, man. You got your Les Paul and a Marshall or whatever you're running through. Not a lot of hoopla, and it's just in your face rock and roll, metal, whatever you want to call it. What but what about I, to the point? My first album that I bought with my own money was uh, Steve Miller's "Fly Like an Eagle." Yep, "Fly Like an Eagle." First one I bought. But a great song. I got Christmas was "Kiss Alive." Yeah. Was the, no, no, no. Wait, I lie. I lie. The very, very first album I got as a Christmas present, as a little little tie, was Alice Cooper "Goes to Hell." Now, now you bring up a big name there. Alice Cooper was instrumental. I mean, Alice, I said Kiss might be the first, but I think School's Out was the first hard rock tune that I was like connected. And that's what was on the radio too, especially yeah. depending on what demographic you were in. You know? Oh, yeah. In the DFW area, that was, that was on the radio. Yeah. So. And great. It's a great album. Those early Cooper albums. Yeah, I love them. Man. I still love them. They're great. Only Women Bleed and Welcome to My Nightmare and yep. Muscle of Love and, you know, Under My Wheel. I mean, so many great songs, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, my first three albums would have been Alice Cooper Goes to Hell. True. Maybe that was that set me on a path, you know. <laughs> right. That was the key <laughs> moment. That was the key moment. Then, you know, his Steve Miller pops in and he goes, man, you can fly like an eagle, you know? And then, uh, then Kiss comes in. We're going to go rock all night, you know? So it was it. It was the Trinity. Now, did you listen Did you listen to much country, though, being a Texas boy? like, And by that, I'm talking like Willie and Waylon. Like, I very much remember the song, um, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up, up To Be Out, Outlaw. Yeah, Outlaw Country, right? Right? No, oh, day in and day out, brother. Yeah, day in and day out, and you know, growing up in Boyd was part of it. I, hell, I'm a huge country fan now. I mean, my uh, one of my favorites is the White Yoakum. I listen to a lot of Alan Jackson, you know, Kobe Keith. Uh, I'm all over the honky tonk stuff. Oh yeah, oh, okay. Hell yeah! Matter of fact, it's playing in the background right now. I don't know if you can hear it. <laughs> uh, no, I can't actually. No, yeah, well, that's probably good because I don't want to jack with our sound. But uh, what's going on right now, man? Yeah, that's what's right now. That's the country I can listen to. Cash. Oh, the no, this country. they're playing today. That ain't country. That's fucking That's terrible. It's, dress, it's pop dressed up like country. Somebody exactly. put a cowboy hat on some pretty girl or or some good looking dude. I don't give a fuck. What are you right, 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 right. And, and somebody else wrote it. You know, people like Dwight Yoakam, they write and compose their own shit. You know, Alan Jackson, he's playing his own guitar. He's playing his guitar. You know, and. Hey, there's some yeah. good dudes. Paisley, uh, what's his name? Brad, Brad Paisley. What a hell of a player, man. That yeah. dude. Brad Paisley. Yeah. 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 Um, somebody had a comment I wanted you to see real quick. Um, Solitude Eternus at Hell's was one of the most beautiful and powerful shows ever. It's more than the show. It's the meaning behind it, which is, yeah, for sure, man. Thanks, Shrikova. That's a great – I assume you were there. So um, what about uh, – so I know you play guitar. When did you start – when did you pick up an instrument? Where, where did you start? Did you start on the piano? Did you start yeah, with the guitar? Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, I must say probably about when I was about five years old, uh, mom started me in piano lessons. Okay. So I did that. I guess off and on for years, pretty much until I graduated to guitar, which I got my first guitar when I was 11. So, you know, that's when I got, hey, man, you know, ain't cool. Well, I'll tell you, it is cool, but it wasn't when you're 11. So that kind of sat on the wayside and started my path uh, with guitar. But Did then you ended up going back to piano shortly after just, you know, because I'll tell any musician or any aspiring musician, if 
if you're gonna or if you have any thoughts learn learn you some basic piano because that carries with you through i don't i don't give a shit if you pick up the zerna next week get to why am i preaching anyway yeah piano's cool man <laughs> oh yeah for sure i mean i can plunk around on chords i can't read I'm right. one of those guys who can't read, but I mean, I, I tried the piano lesson thing. I had that really mean old lady that was like really a not you know, exactly not fun yeah. to learn with. And it didn't last very long. But, um, you know, you, you, you talk a lot of your your really, really full composer type musicians can at least wind their way around on a piano pretty decently. It, it just opens up the. the it, it does. And, and you can always use it as a basis for anything else that you may pick up to learn because the knowledge and the theory is there and most of the other stuff is wrapped around that guitar whatnot guitar, guitar is a piano it's, it's you know you got your strings you got your notes which could be the um the beaters and it, it's all it's all it's all the same it's just yeah. it looks different did you start on an acoustic or an electric did you coax them into a I, electric I got in with my Run of the mill pawn shop electric with no name and some yeah. little, you know, five watt no name amp all for 40 bucks, you know. Right, wow, nice, nice, all right, right. 40 bucks. My mom would not allow me to do that. She I had to have the acoustic first. I got a I remember it was a a, a tobacco sunburst Chinese knockoff dreadnought called a Stella. It was probably Stella. a Sears, yeah, Stella. It was probably a Sears. Dude, speaking of that. We were talking about concerts. My first concert ever was Cheap Trick in 78. Well, because of that, I got the Sears catalog. Thank you, Rick Nelson. And got me a knockoff Sunburst Fender Strat. It was on Sears. I ordered the damn thing. You know, right, it right. came in a big box. We had to go down to Sears and pick it up. But because of Cheap Trick and Rick Nelson, I graduated from my pawn shop to my Sears and Roebuck. Those and I kept truck. this son of a bitch up until about 2001. No I kidding. Still used it. Me and Steve even spent some time hot rodding that thing. No way, really? Sure the hell did, man. How about and that? I, I gave it away for a, was it a Charvel. A little bit of an upgrade, maybe, kind of. A bit of an upgrade. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. What, now, but, yeah, you, I, you, I kept that son of a gun until 2001. Like I said, me and Steve would. Me and Steve used to actually be neighbors. He he literally lived around the corner. Uh -huh. We'd work on material, but he'd come over and it's like, man, let's, let's hot ride that some bitch. Because the body was solid, man. The body sure. was like two and a half inches thick. It weighed right. like 400 pounds. I mean, it was a solid piece of wood. We knew we had something to work with. You just you just gutted it and threw new electronics and yeah, for, yeah. Yeah, you know the routine. Got rid of that Sears and Roebuck bridge, you know, <laughs> whatever oh, yeah. that thing was. I'm sure. But, yeah, it was like some nails sticking out and you wrapped some bitch around it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like a telegraph telegraph wire, right? Yeah. Yeah. What um what do you what do you have now? What do what gear do you have anything now that you work with? Yeah, I uh my uh go to right now is my Schecter. It's uh oh, a Hellraiser? No, 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 no. I went for the uh Damien. That's that's puppy right oh, here. The Damien, yeah, the single cut. Yeah, nice. Yeah, the this uh is, this is my go to, but First thing I did was EMGs came out. We put, we put some Seymour Duncans in this puppy. Okay. Yeah. Got nice. I got and, Duncan. Uh, Randall. Randall's my still go to amp. I think I got Duncans in my. Yeah, I got Duncans. I don't know which ones they are. I got to look them up. But I got Duncans in my uh, my Dean Caddy. This is kind of my workhorse. Yeah. With uh, with the Floyd and. That, I like these Seymour Duncans. They're nice and fat. They got a nice, a nice tone to them. I've always used Seymour. I had a uh, rich bitch at one time, and I put the Seymour Invaders in there. Was, yeah, I got. I, I'm not sure that was a stock. I need to look into what they came with. I just can't remember off the top of my head. I bought, I bought a bunch of guitars all at once. I grabbed the. I, believe it or not, I grabbed this. I love this man. This Epiphone Cantrell. Yeah, you yeah. like that one, huh? Uh -huh. I've, looked at, I've looked at that. Dude, this is a killer guitar. For 850 man, you're not going to get a Les Paul this nice. I, I was looking at five, $6,000 Les Pauls. Right, right. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not worth the money for me. Not worth it. 
Yeah, but that is nice. So, but then I got a PRS and. What do you think there. of the PRS? I love PRSs. I got a custom twenty-two. That's probably yeah, my. I'm thinking about. I'm looking at some of those too. I know what I tell you. What I do when I add to my collection. This is kind of out there, but I want me a Telecaster. I want to get me a Telecaster. I, you know, I've never played one. It's one of the. I had a Strat. I got into some hard times after a, a breakup with a woman that I was living with, and I, I had to sell it, and it killed me, man. It was a Strat Plus American with the, uh, with the lace sensors, like the Stevie Ray Vaughan pickups right. on it. And man, I gave that thing away. I man, I'd love to have that thing. Eric Johnson blue with yeah. the, you know, the blue and white. And just, you know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to survive. I had to do it to, you know, make rent, that kind of thing. So, but um, so okay, so you're doing guitar. What um at what stage do you realize or or figure out that hey, I can sing, man. I got I got a little bit of, I got some pipes going on. Is that a high school thing or a junior high thing? Were you doing the choir thing? What 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 told you you could do that? Uh well, I guess uh brass tax is a necessity. Um I was playing guitar. I you know, I started my first band ever, 14, 15, it was called The Holy. Buddy down the street sang. <laughs> Lyle played drums in there too. <laughs> no way. Okay. Yeah. Well, that would have been a little bit later. That's probably about 15. No, 16. 16. Yeah. Cool. The whole, and Lyle played drums there. Uh, I still played guitar. Buddy sang. And then fast forward a little bit, me and Lyle hooked up. Uh, we did a little three piece. Um, and we're like, well, we need a singer. And it's like, well, I, you know, I can step up to the mic, whatever. You know, ain't no thing. So I'll still playing guitar. Like, I right, just give me a mic. I, I fuck with this. Did that. And even at that time, I mean, we we're this far advanced, and I'm still thinking, I'm a guitarist. Man. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I'll tell that story a thousand times. I, no, we, we can do this. All right, this is cool. It's cool. I got it. You know, we got the, you know, scary guitarist and raw vocals. And then fast forward a little bit more, uh, band Graven Image, we break up. Mine break well, up. hang on one sec. If I could go back for one sec. The Holy was your first band? Yeah. What what were you doing? Were you doing just covers or were you writing oh, originals? No, no. We started right out of the gate with originals, man. And what right. kind of music? We were doing uh I guess you'd say punk. I mean, we were doing stuff like Channel Three, Black Flag, Government okay. Issue, you know, mm -hmm. Sex Pistols, that that style, but mostly stuff like Government Issue, Dead Kennedy's, uh what I say, Channel Three, you know, uh, Meat Puppets, uh, uh, Bad, right, right. In Green, you know, stuff like that. Right, and then and then you start to move more towards a metal. Well, I was already, um, I was already a metalhead at that time, and like I said, my buddy, you know, I, we just you just kind of get together, and he was into like, um, I don't know what you would have called it back then, uh, new wave, whatever it was called in the eighties. Like Tears for Fears and stuff yeah, like that? Yeah. No, more stuff, more along the line. It's same time frame, but like Dream Syndicate and bands like that. You Ultra know, Vox. Dream, Dream, Ultra, yeah, exactly. Yeah, a little bit more, a little more guitar by house, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Killing Joke. Killing Joke, okay, yeah. That type of stuff, right? Oh, awesome. So, you know, he's there. I'm over here. I'm still, you know, I'm still, I just bought fucking the uh, number of the beast. So that's what I'm hearing in this side of my brain, and you know, killing joke is going on on this side. So we just kind of did a thing called the holy and we just started writing our own shit just right away. You know, we just, but I was not a very good guitarist at the time. I knew how to play my power chord. So that made it real easy. Just, just yeah, right. you know, boxing around and chunking stuff. around, chunking around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, it sounded like black flag. So I must be good. You know, and let's keep going with it. <laughs> yeah. That's one way of, th of thinking about it. Yeah. There you go, right. <laughs> So, yeah, so that's where it started with that, that type style. And we threw in, on, I, I snuck in some metal riffs as I progressed in my playing, uh, just mm -hmm. because that's what I was listening to. So some of the holy had that typical um, punk attitude going on. Plus, you know, my little one-offs were, we put Maiden in there. What the hell? You know, <laughs> so that's, that's what we did with that. And then went straight to Graven Image, which was a combination of God damn, Merciful Fate meets oh. Saxon meets Trouble 
So a lot more new wave of British heavy metal influence now. Yeah. Priestly, Ma Priestly Maiden stuff is coming in. Yeah, with that that uh, merciful fate, like Melissa, aggress aggressive type of stuff. The dark, the little bit of the dark. Atmosphere. Definitely dark. I mean, that's you know, Graven Image. We were scary, and yeah, uh, that's <laughs> that's where we took it. Yeah. So I would say, I I know I could come up with a better analogy of it, but it was along. It was really along the path of merciful fate because i had got you know the king diamond album at that time too and it's just you know i was blown away by that shit. oh yeah for sure because you know? it was just totally so different i'm like dude this is the shit that's what we're gonna do so by now, the end, you know, i actually learned how to play and tune my guitar so we actually used to cover uh we actually covered melissa uh black funeral we covered that we did don't break oh, the wow. oath yeah we nice. covered, don't break the oath so we were playing that that type of stuff what year are we talking here robert I, we this would have been around 86 86 87. all right so bands like uh slayer sa around kind oh, of sure, so yeah. our watchtower slayer all day long in the truck you know watchtowers coming on right probably yeah. right around this time yeah yeah um, so that's where that kind of I, I don't know technical metal i mean slayer's not technical but it was technical for what it you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. well actually i was i mentioned slayer sa the SA the the San Antonio one, which was this the, they were like oh, a thrash, yeah they were yeah Slayer SA was uh, like eighty three eighty four I think Not yeah familiar with that. okay yeah it was they were out of San Antonio though no, which I, was, I guess I was into Hell Awaits and Rain and Blood and, uh, okay yeah well of course I mean yeah of course we're all we're all digging on that stuff Metallica is coming on Anthrax is coming on all the thrash yeah, yeah Kill 'Em All see that that influenced me the Kill 'Em All album yeah. influenced me quite a bit. Because I heard that on just one little rock and roll radio show every night. And I was like, fuck, what the fuck is this? You know? How about stuff like, I, I got to believe, like Venom and Motorhead. You're you're hitting on that a little bit. Venom? Yeah, no, I never did. Never did touch on uh, Motorhead very much. Really? Not, not so much. Uh, but Venom, Celtic Cross. Uh, Celtic, yeah. Did but, you do much tape trading? Did you do any of the... Yeah, I, no, the, yeah. I was usually the one giving them out. Okay. And that's because the people in the country had to learn what music was. So I was, I was passing them out, you know, like candy. You oh, know, okay, you were doing that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Go check this out. <laughs> See, I weirdly missed that. I remember it, but I don't really remember. Like, I remember kids talking about it, but strangely looking back, I never, I don't know, man. I was in well, all I that stuff. Trade, you say, but oh, I always, you're just, you know. You're just I sharing with your friends. Like, Maiden, Saxon. You know, mm -hmm. Judas Priest, and it's like, give it to my buddy for the weekend. Right. Or whatever. Yeah, out. yeah. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how it was that we were both there and we kind of missed out on the tape trading thing. I just did. I think John took all that because JP was huge tape trader. Well, really? Know? Yeah. Yeah, I think he I think he cornered the market in Texas for that. <laughs> this dude just... Was he, and, and John is originally from the, the Dallas-Fort Worth area? JP? Yeah, he's... um. Out of San Antonio. So, yeah, don't get me lying, uh, but I'm pretty sure from the San Antonio area is where it came from before they came up here. So when, I guess, um, were, when you got out of school, were you, like, uh, well, to go back again to the singing thing, we didn't quite touch on that yet. Like, did that only happen once you got in SA, or were you actually doing – singing for other bands prior to that no no man i, I was i was a rock star in my bedroom you know cranking the oh, I, I know all that yes i know yeah. <laughs> i still <laughs> am you I still, still am, am. <laughs> yeah no that's uh it, i guess if, if if there was any place that was rehearsal it would have been the bedroom because like yeah i'm sitting back there with the new uh yeah whatever the new was and i'm singing right along and trying to figure that shit out back in the day when you had to pick up the needle do this and go the fuck was that riff? yeah 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 it's even harder to do on a cassette oh missed it Damn. yep 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 doing that but you know singing along the whole time you know learn a few riffs i would uh plug my stereo into my amp yeah and totally crank it along with my guitar and i'd be playing like i don't know ufo or something so then i could play sing and everything was just like at 400 you're hearing it like you were a part of the band yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I did that too. Early on with the kiss. Here's a funny one. True story. Down in Houston, you know, you don't have too many multi-story homes back in the 80s, right? Or, yeah. well, 70s into the 80s. And we had a rancher when we first moved there with the freaking um, no asphalt shingles there, man, because it gets too hot, right? They use those shaker, like almost, I think they were like cedar shingles, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. That's, why, that's why you couldn't fucking light off fireworks down there because you'd set the whole, burn down the whole neighborhood. Fucking neighborhood on fire, yeah. right? But um, I used to take, and you'll remember this for sure. My parents' stereo was a combined eight track. Uh, it was a combo thing. It was the, it was the AM FM tuner, the eight track, and the and the the record player. Right? Did it so, have a drop or two? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'd put the speakers up to the front after get home from school. My mom would be working. My dad would be working. Stepdad would be working. I put the speakers out front. I'd climb up on the roof because it wasn't hard to get up there. I'd take my acoustic, my acoustic. I didn't even have an electric yet at this point. Yeah. And I'm up there miming Paul Stanley doing Love Gun and, you know, wow. got love for sale. And that, that was my big, that was the biggest rock star I ever became, Rob. That, that was it right there. Well, you, the neighborhood, man. You're the neighborhood rock star. I was the king of the, the cul-de-sac. That's what they call me. The cul-de-sac cul world, man. King. <laughs> yeah. the world. So how do you end up connecting with John Perez and how how does SA start that those wheels start turning? And were you when you got out of high school, did you go on to any did you go to college? Did you go to or did you just go to work or or what was your what was your mindset well, at that point? Yeah, um after I got out of high school, uh that's well in the last few years of my high school was when Graven Image was starting. So did that, right? And this this where Graven in, in, Image and SA tie in. Because me and Lyle were in Graven Image. I had moved to Irving, Texas at the time. UTA is not too far from there. It's in Arlington. So right. Lyle was going to UTA and John was going to UTA. And they met at, at college, right? And, uh, you know, they had their talks and whatnot and the whole thing with the original solitude with uh, Brad maybe leaving or Gabe Hart not wanting to sing anymore. You know, like I said, don't pull down any of this, but, uh, but that's basically what was going on. Me and Lyle were still doing Graven Image and, you know, one day he's like, eh, I don't know if I'm really down with this anymore. And, you know, basically I'm like, all right, that's cool. Ain't no thing. And hadn't heard from him for a while. And he calls me up one day and he goes, Hey man, still jamming, right? I said, every fucking day. And uh, he goes, well, I met this dude up here at UGA, and uh, he's got this uh, uh, new band thing. I'm I'm just paraphrasing, right? So, that, like I said, don't quote me on shit. That's fine. It's just got this doom band thing going on, you know, and they're looking for a singer. What was the first thing I told Lyle? I'm not a vocalist. I'm not a singer, yeah. yeah. He goes, well, they're not, they don't need a guitarist, man. He goes, uh, all they need, we've already got two guitars. And he, you should come out, man. I'm like, all right, well, fuck it. What am I going to do Saturday anyway? Whatever. Let's, I'll go. So I went up there, and I had, Lyle gave me a cassette of some of the SA stuff. Like, it came upon one night, and Sojourner. He goes, just give the, give, it's a little, I think it's a little four-song demo, maybe five. Right, the demo, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the little demo cassette. And uh, he said, hey, check these, just check these songs out. And, you know, just put some vocals on it. So I listened to it. I'm like, you know, I'm used to screaming Halford and Dickinson and, you know, Scorpions. I mean, for God's sake, Klaus Mine is God. I mean, that's, yeah, uh, you get uh, Klaus. I mean, Scorpions, that that's that's my band. I, well, let's say they stop it about Love at First Sting, but from Lonesome Crow up to Love at First Sting, Scorpions. That's, so, Rob, that's, that's exactly where I'm locked in in that same period. And the Uli, the Uli stuff is my favorite, even though the the Matias stuff's a little more metal. It the is metal. Oh, I mean, Matias is a great, great guitarist, man. He's, he's hands great. down a good guitarist. And but in trance, in trance, in trance, well, is my that took Scorpions to where they were. I mean, Oli is fucking god. That, yep. That's all it was. It was yep. fucking god. And that Scorpions was just so experimental, especially if you listen to Lonesome Crow. Oh, Lonesome Crow is so Lonesome weird. Crow. I love it. I love, I love it. it. 
Love it. Yeah. So if you go to Lonesome Crow and then listen to Blackout, it's like, what the fuck happened? Right? They're like, who is this? It's not the same band. It can't be the same band, right? No, it's not the same guys. It sounded like a kraut rock, pro, a kraut prog rock band on the first album with killer solos, right? Yeah. But I love it, right? So anyway, I lost my place. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's, you know, I mean, that's the vocalist that I was influenced by. You know, you take just 1980, you know, Number of the Beast and Blackout. Um, those things are spinning day in and day out. So that's that's who that's who's in my head as far as vocalists go. And Halford, you know, uh, Ozzy. But um, so I'm thinking, well, you know, they, they say do what you know. You know, if you're an author, write what you know about, right? So do mm -hmm. what you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's what I know. <laughs> so I just went up in there and I was like, I don't even know how to put this shit on top of this. And if First time out, I tried to emulate gay part. It's like, this, this ain't my thing. This ain't working, man. It ain't working. Right. So I'm just going to pull out a Dickinson or, you know, Klaus or something. And it did. And just, you know, I guess made it my own. And um, then, you know, we sat around and drank, shoot the shit. I went back to the house. And uh, then I, I, I don't know, Lyle was like, hey, man, you know, Chris thought that that was pretty cool. You should come back out sometime. I'm like, all right. And that's basically it. And that's all she wrote. And it then was all, it wasn't even real. So it wasn't really like a formal thing. It was almost like a laid back sort of. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there was no formality. You just you know, drive up in my Ford F one fifty. Got some Sabbath blasting, cooler in the back, you know. And that's all it was. And you know, I, I don't, I don't know if it was a done deal before I got there or not. But uh, yeah, right. There was no, well, we you know, we got a few other guys we're going we're gonna to listen to. Yeah. And it was just, that's, it was that. And then next thing you know, we're recording the first album. <laughs> was just, well, did they have the record? Did they already have a record contract before that? No, we, there was nothing okay. before that. They had put out the demo. Uh, and then I joined, Lyle joined, did a few members swapping things here and there. We had a guy named Martinez on second guitar at uh, the first go round, but then that came and went, and then Rivera Egger joined, and that's when we really started sitting down and getting tight and and really writing material for the first album. Okay, and we spent some time on that. I think John already had a few songs together, and but like once the five of us got together, it was just uh, it just happened because you know. John already had stuff and ideals. Lyle's already a musician. We got Edgar, who's already a great musician, who played in like Battalion and uh, a couple other bands from the area here. I, I'm, he's going to hit me if I can't remember the other one, but I can't, so I'm just pow. But, uh, you know, already a bunch of good musicians with basically the same ideal because I had started listening to Trouble at that time. And I'm thinking, this is, this is the shit, man. This is where I want, this is the path I want to take with music. Right. I already had that floating around up here. John, JP already was already there. Lyle was, you know, we were doing the whole Graven Image thing, and Edgar was just a good guitarist, period, hands down. Put the five of us together and just all those ideals, we just took all of them and put them in one big pot, kind of stirred it and said, that looks good, man. What's wrong with that? And then there's the first album. So, all right, so you, you do Into the Depths of Sorrows. Was that recorded locally? I, I, I have, actually, let me... So I have the reissues because I, uh, as I said, I kind of came into it late. So I grabbed the, these are the uh, new Dissonance Productions. Uh, looks like 22 they came out. Have you seen these? I, probably not. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, like a double. It's a double with um, with Into the Depths and um, um, Crimson on it. So I, that's super cool. Yeah. yeah it's not, I mean, it's a nice way to get them both. Definitely. Well done package. It's got a nice, you know, nice booklet with it, um, and the the recordings sound great. So, was I did notice a little bit that it seemed like a lot of the lyrics were already written at that point in time for the first album. Well, so you well, didn't, yeah, because we took a lot of what Gabe Hart had already done, like it came upon one night, white shit, transcending sentinels. Those were already done. Mm -hmm. That's that's the stuff that came off the demo. So, I mean, we just. No point in rewriting it, yeah. And added, and I think uh, John had already had Mirror of Sorrow wrote before we actually started getting together. So that was like the first 
major group project we worked on was Mirasol. That was our first demo out of the out of the batch. Mm -hmm. And yes, it was recorded in Dallas. It was recorded at uh, Dallas Sound Lab, and um, it was uh, well. We went there because the guy that was the engineer decided he wanted to tackle metal as his project, right? Okay. Yeah. So you know we. Uh -oh. we ten dollars an hour you know to, to use the studio which right, now, right. Now lab at the time was the biggest recording studio here in the area uh king diamond had done a lot of his stuff there so that's why we're like you know yeah hey, you, you like it right because you know john the people were friends with him because he's from the area he's like yeah or i don't know i don't know the conversation but so we're like yeah we'll go there and this guy wants to do this and he's getting him get a good break but we're working after hours so we recorded the first album in like 24 hours man what oh motherfucker yeah like it, it's, the whole thing was done in under i'm I'm just i'm gonna just stop it at 40. we did the whole thing at 40 hours because i remember doing vocals for that thing like three in the morning you know wow Holy <laughs> yeah shit. we were just plugging away just ding 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 and we got done with it and i listened to it and went well that sounds like crap <laughs> So we had uh, Danny Brown uh, re-engineer mm -hmm. first. So that we went over to his studio, and I honestly don't remember the name of his studio at, at the time. Had him re-engineer that. So, you know, we buddied up with the guy, and he's good people. He knew what he was doing, and so we went back to him for the second album. And uh, so, so wait, you took the masters from the first sessions yeah. over to him then, and let he, him fix it up, put his magic on it. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So. And then well, he did crimson. Whatever he had to work with, but and you know, just his ability and you know, we're still young kids too. We don't know shit. Right. You're how old are you? Do you remember at this point? I don't know, maybe twenty, twenty one. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I don't know shit. Yeah, I was yeah. just in my garage last week, right? You know, so I, <laughs> Yeah, and now you're recording in a studio, right? Yeah, right. So uh you know, he fixed it and we were like, Yeah, good, good people. Studios right here, right in the middle of all of us. So we just naturally went there for the second album which at that time everybody had grown and uh, we got in there we've been working on that material forever so it was just doing the second album was great because we had it we knew the shit i mean like you know the back of our hand got in there and knocked it out he's running the board you know it was just super easy yeah you know? well and you got the experience of because it was a lot more relaxed you know you got and, the experience you know, of the first time under your belt already so you kind of yeah yeah got to have a vibe on what's going to happen to some extent exactly right, right? Yeah. exactly now how much be truthful here now no 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 uh no need to be demure here how much partying was going on in these uh, sessions um just a tiny little bit i'm i'm trying to think but I, we didn't have time to party on the first album mm. <laughs> we didn't have you know that, yeah, to, the, you to the beer store and back we yeah done. <laughs> we're done, <laughs> we're done right. man. yeah 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 uh, actually, there. No, honestly, uh, I mean, sure, you know, there was there was beer in the studio, but usually towards the end of the day, after we knocked out the riffs and whatnot, and we got the stuff on tape, which we did use tape, two inch tape. Thank you, Ampex. Of course. And uh, we used Ampex up all the way. We used that on alone. We blew half of our fucking budget just getting two tapes for it. Yeah, I know. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And we, you can't record a Solitude album on one tape. So, we, I think we had yeah. three or four of them. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, well, they things cost them 10 grand a pop, you know? It's like, Jesus. But we we were dead set on doing it on two-inch tape. Okay, so here's a funny question. I, I didn't have, because I got some medical stuff going here, I didn't have enough... I didn't have the kind of time I usually like to have to do my due diligence, but I did run across a really funny, I think it was funny, uh, interview with you and Perez uh, from, I think it was 2008, right around when Alone came out. Was uh, it a Polish interview? Or yeah, I think it was a Polish interview, yeah. It and is. there's just some funny shit on that thing. You're kind of quiet. Perez is going off. He's having, a, he's having a time with that, right? But he mentioned about the fact that, that, um when, when the when this album the first album came out it, it was kind of stalled for a long time and that was the first album or the second that came out that roadrunner picked up on that that was the first one 
first album, right. Yeah, it that was kind of a debacle in and of itself. I mean, I, I don't know all the ins and outs because honestly, at that time, I joined the band. We got a record deal. We're recording. I didn't, I didn't care. Yeah, right. We deal with it. You know? Yeah. But it was like they had it. They didn't want it. We signed them. Then it was, I don't know, a money thing. And then they're like, well, we'll shop it around. And it's like, well, we can do that. We can do that by ourselves. Yeah, we could have done that. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I honestly don't know what happened, but that deal severed. And I don't know if they hooked us up with Roadrunner or if we ended up doing it ourselves with Roadrunner. I think Perez like, said that that they got you a deal with Maybe them. they got us in the door. But, but the funny part about that is you get in with Roadrunner who, you know, were really a big deal in in the eighties with all the metal bands and the the death metal stuff yeah. and everything. We were totally not part not of not their thing, thing though at all. Yeah, you weren't their speed, right? <laughs> right. And yeah, so no. and so, what happens? Tell the story there about because Perez told a funny ass fucking story that he calls up Lee Dorian and Lee says, "Oh, sorry, but sorry to hear you got dropped." And John's like. We got dropped, but you guys wanted to get dropped, I think, right? We did. Yeah, yeah. we were. Yeah, we they weren't giving you any money, right? I mean, you there went was, out. There was nothing there. Our name was on a piece of paper sitting somewhere upstate, you know? I, I don't know. So it was just like, you know, just, just, you know, we we'll just do this. Just let's just get rid of it. Let us go. Yeah. Yeah, just, we're done. Now, how much? You you road, Roadrunner? Roadrunner, yeah. Yeah, I actually. We were on tour with Killers. Uh, I think we were actually in New York when they kind of we got that phone call like, "Hey man, you know, kind of like a breakup. This isn't really working out for yeah. me." You it's know. not you. It's not you. It's me. <laughs> you guys are great, but you know, I think I need to go another way. You yeah, know, right, right. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> similar to that, you know. It's like uh, <laughs> we were sitting back there after the show, going, "Fuck yeah!" We, <laughs> yeah, right. Now, you were out with Paul Deano, right? Paul Deano and Killers, man? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think uh, we did six to eight weeks on the road with those guys, man. That was a hell of a tour. And we were in a Ford Econo line. Six yeah. Of us with our clothes and gear. We took the seats out. <laughs> oh, we were at the warehouse getting ready, and I'm in the Econo line, Ford Econo. We should have been sponsored by Ford. We are a Ford Econo line, I'm in there. I'm... I'm yanking these seats out. Crank, crank, crank. That one's gone. That one's gone. That's how that's how we did that first tour, man. Wow, man. Did you have a trailer All for way from freaking Quebec down to San Diego? Oh and man. In between. And back ding ding ding. Could you imagine doing that now, Robert? I would do it. Would you? I sure the hell would. Just no. make, the only thing I would change is to make sure I had the food, make sure we had our refreshments and a hotel room yeah Just, I'd, I'd ask for three things and like a million dollars but other than that I'd, well but i mean a million just a million, a million? I, i'll go easy i, I was gonna say you're starting low start so they, low. they say you should start high so you can come back you start yeah. low i would I start <laughs> low i just put i just put it right there i just package deal million dollars food and drink hotel in uh, air conditioning because you got to have air, air conditioning air conditioning at the Hyatt, the Hyatt Regency. Yeah, at the Hyatt. Yeah. Right, With your own yeah. en suite, en suites. En suite. And, and then, you know, by the time we're done, the list, we're going to have four pages worth of shit, right? M&Ms with the green M&Ms removed, of oh, course. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. So how much touring then did you do on those first two albums? Was it just the Killers tour? Did you do, did you get over to your did, uh, We did the Killers, and then uh, we turned right around and went out with Fate in 95. With uh, uh, one of our albums, the second one, uh, yeah, we did the we did Fate tour in '95. Wait, fa Fate's warning or Fate? Fate. Oh, Fate. Coming okay. in and dinner and all them. Okay, right, right, right. Yeah. So the that and we did uh, a solo tour in Europe shortly after that. And we were supposed to do it with Count Raven. It was going to be an essay Count Raven bill. Something happened to Count Raven. They had to pull out. So it was us and Revelation from uh, Baltimore. From the Baltimore. Okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with them. Yeah, very Count Ravenish style. Okay. 
but um so we ended up doing that tour with we ended up taking over the headlining spot uh then came back and then we went out in 97 98 with savior machine another european tour is that is that through darkest hour or was that for downfall probably for downfall no. Yeah, because Darkest Hour was 94. So that uh, was the Fate Tour. Okay. Was that. Then when we did our solo tour, I think we were still living on through the Darkest Hour at that time. Right? Mm hmm I'm asking you, right? <laughs> well, no, the question I have about that is, so you ended up signing with Pavement, and you ended up going over to England to produce the next album, the 94s. Yeah, uh, Paul Johnston. Yeah, Through the Darkest Hour. How, do you remember how that all came about, or was that was was Perez that doing was most of that? One of those things to where, well, we honestly just wanted to like kind of do that rock and roll thing to where it's like, you know, you're all together. You hear because when we were doing it here in the, at home in those first albums, you know. Still going to work, still going home. He's going, He's still going home. Yeah. Here. You're driving there, you're getting them going to work. You know, that's a bitch. And so we like, you know, let's just take two weeks, man. It's if we can fit it in the budget with what our advance was or our budget was, let's just let's just blow the whole load and you know. I don't know how John came across Paul Johnston, but so we're like, yeah, we just took off. Two weeks went over there, you know. We got a, like a bed and breakfast type of thing, mm -hmm. and shacked up, literally shacked up as musicians for two weeks. We got up, went to the studio all day, came back together, listened to the tapes and the recordings we had made that day. Make right. notes. What do we want to change tomorrow? What do we want to do tomorrow? Was that good? Was this not good? Um, which it really was the best way to do it because like. You know, uh, Ninth Day, Stormbringer, the chorus on that song, something completely different. We none of us can remember it now, but we came back to the B and B or yeah, bread and back, bread, bread and breakfast, but whatever. Bread and breakfast. Yeah, yeah. Had the beds, and you've had too much vodka already, sir. I know. I need to back off, man. <laughs> <laughs> the, so I'm sitting there, and and this is exceptionally doomy and. Raw and manly is I'm doing the dishes right and listening to Lyle's got the cassette playing in the other room. We're playing Ninth Day, and I'm standing there. I'm like, fuck what the fuck that man. So I just started singing the, the Stormbringer while I was doing the dishes in the kitchen at the B&B, &B, and we went back the next day and just scrapped whatever it was we had and just redid that whole section of the choruses. On that okay. Song. But that's the kind. That's what that the, I make that point because that's the kind of shit you can do when you're encapsulated in that situation. Yeah, you're in that you're in that headspace where it's a full. You're fully immersed in the recordings as opposed to worrying about going home and seeing your girlfriend or right whatever. Got you got a work thing you got to do. There's, no, there's zero distractions. Yeah, there's exactly. You're yeah. there to do one thing. You got one job to get that recorded yeah. the best yeah. you can. Yeah. And it worked out quite well because, you know, again, you, the five of us, bam, right here in the B&B. &B. Yeah, and this is out, studio back, studio there's back. A back on, there's a back on uh, black version there. That's the back on back, black uh, double there. Um, I have seen that one. Man, I I love this album, man. I love this. I mean, I love all your, you know, I mean, it's going to sound a little bit like I'm blowing smoke, but I'm really not. They're really yes, Darkest Hour has some production issues that are a little weird that you guys have addressed a million times. So we won't even bother getting into it unless you want to talk oh, about it. But, nah, but but the thing about you this band is yes, there's only six albums, but every single album, start to finish, is fucking classic. It's so good. There's there's not a there's not a a track where you're like eh. Well, I can guarantee you there ain't no filler material. That's right. There's no skippers on any of these albums. And I'm not saying it because we're in it, but that was the thing. We didn't just go, all right, we got five good ones. You know, hey, you know, John has a cool riff. Let's, let's, put, let's fill that five-minute spot. Yeah. None of us like it. We, we, we're going, shit, we're running out of tape because, we, you know, we weren't done 
Recording. Too many cool ideas, too many yeah. good good things, yeah. And I think you've said it, and I believe John said it too, that you guys make this – none of you guys are rich millionaires out of this. None of you guys have made big-time money out of this. Um, you make this music because it's it's in you, man. You have to – you have to purge it. It has to come out, right? It's well, like an I extra thing. Yeah, the, the 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 five of us. It's weird talking about myself. I don't usually do that, but uh, the five of us. It, it's it's part of our core essence. Yeah, regardless, and that you know, just like that. Now, to just because, I'm, and we haven't broke up. We never broke up. We never said we did. But even because you know, if a band breaks up, you know, that that guy goes off to be an accountant. He goes over here to work at the home for the elderly or whatever. Even though we weren't in the same area together at any one given time for a few years, we were all stuck in fucking still knocking out music. I mean, like Lyle with his projects, you know, Edgar doing shit. John's got plenty of stuff going on, you know, Liquid Sound Company. I'm still kicking it. You know, it's, 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 you don't just because we're not together, we're not, yeah. like I said, I didn't take a job as an accountant. It's in your DNA to yeah. do it. Right, right. Um, so actually, I mean that that brings up a good point. Um, you, you mentioned the fact that you're not it, just because you're not together, it doesn't mean that you ever broke up. Right. The music, the music business has changed dynamically from those early days when you guys and the especially, you know, you caught the tail end of the big, the big oh, machination. Oh, we missed it by this much. Right. Right. It's, I, well, but I mean, yeah, it's true though. In a lot of ways, you were yeah. you were at the tail end of the big machinery of the the music tail business. end of the the arena rock and all that shit. Because I mean, us guys, that was our vision. You know, I want to play Reunion Arena. I want sure. to do you know whatever the Globe or whatever. You know, I want to be up there like the Scorpions or Maiden or Sabbath. You know, ACDC. I saw ACDC several times at Reunion right. Arena here, and it's just like. It's massive, man. Mm -hmm. that, that's where my vision was as a kid. But like I said, by the time we started getting old enough to do it and to actually be musicians, that shit was already, you know, going by the wayside. It was just well, you had you had digital music pop in. You had yeah. Napster come in, and suddenly albums weren't selling anymore. I mean, everybody shits on Lars. You know, for years he was the the you know the the whipping boy of that whole thing but he was right ultimately he was right in the end right i mean yeah, i never had an opinion i mean you got to protect yourself and mm -hmm. he was protecting himself he was protecting metallica and himself i mean it's yeah. you know when, when you're at their level it's an investment at, at some point you know huge investment sure i mean now we know that it can be utilized and harnessed in a good way you got band camps you got you know i think it weirdly, I, I would say in a weird, strange way, to some extent, Solid, Solitude SA is now maybe the legend is is bigger than the actual time frame of when you guys were doing it. The legend is bigger now. I mean, Hell's is kind of a, I think, kind of an indicator of that. Um, did you guys, well, I want to talk about some of your other stuff, and I promised I'd keep you in the two hour range. I don't want to keep you longer than that. We're already yeah. An hour and fifteen. So I want to try to get you wrapped in out of here in thirty minutes or so. Um, what? So we'll move on from from the 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 SA stuff with with this. Two things: when you guys got done in Hell's Heroes, and you're you're backstage and you're you're hitting beers and you're you're yucking it up with all the other industry guys and your fellow band you know friends and bands and stuff. Were you guys at all think talking to one another, going, "Man, dude, that was fucking rad." We should do more of that. Maybe we should start thinking about doing something. Is there any thing to do for SA at this point? Or have you guys done what you need to do? Have you said all you need to say? Well, here's the thing. Um, when we decided to do Hell's Hero, you know, our, that was it. That was our focus. You know, it's like, fuck it. Can we even play together anymore? You know, right. You know, could. Not, I don't mean there was like bad tension or anything. I mean, just you know, can can we can you still doing play it? Or you know, whatever. Just you getting know, up and doing it again. Yeah. You know, uh, can you still sing? You know, that kind of shit. It's like, yeah, okay, we got this. So we focused on Hell's Hero. And come on, let's be honest. We knew that there'd be some offers, right? I mean, that's not being egotistical. It's like, well, we kind of knew that there would be probably some offers. Maybe, hopefully, 
And uh, we were just going to wait until Hell's Heroes was done to make decisions on. All right, dude, you know, <clears throat> like like you said, after the show, it's like, wow, we pump, we're ready to keep going. Let's start a tour next week. You know, we all had to kind of wait until this was over with to see how each individual felt. Maybe, you know, one of the other guys was like, yeah, you know, it was good. You know, I'm going to go back to what I was doing in South Texas or whatnot. You know, right. it was fun, guys. Thing. You know, you had to wait for that to feel because you're working with five different people, five different personalities. You know, you sure. got to factor all that in. And, uh, yeah, there was totally a consensus of, fuck yeah, man, what the hell? So uh, we are uh, eyeballing offers right now. I know we've got a couple of things that um, are more than likely going to happen. So it, there might be some festivals. I don't know when, where, how, who, right. or how many. But, yes, we are now um, taking offers and looking them over to see what is possible for us in, in the very near future. I'm not talking 10 years from now. I'm talking, you know, month or two, two, three months, you know, four months from now. Yeah. The summer festival, the European yeah. stuff. Sure. Yeah. So, and I, I yeah. guess, do all you guys have day jobs at this point still, or, or Robert, are you still lot tied mostly to the music thing? Yeah, no, I do not have a day okay. job. Uh, John has his thing. Going on, <clears throat> I think you know Lyle's busy with um, uh, Girl Town and his books and so on and so forth. I think Covington and Edgar, I guess you could say, have day jobs. I'm not sure what Edgar does right now. Right, but uh, yeah. Well, um, and the only reason I ask that is because it, you know if you get these offers and things, if somebody's got like a real responsible, yeah, and that's the thing too. We had to take that into consideration. Yeah, I mean, you know. Cubs got a wife and a kid, right? You, you can't right. when you're 20, you can't just go fuck it. I'm leaving next week. I'll see you. I'm leaving before. for two months. Yeah. Good luck, right? Yeah. Because you're not tw you're not 20 years old but anymore. That has to be factored in. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Taking these festivals will be the, the best way to achieve that for all of us, for the festivals, for the sure. fans, for us, for the promoters. You know, any one of us can take off a Monday and, and a, or a Friday and a Monday zip on over to wherever, have the weekend, zip on back Monday, and they can go back to what they were doing. Right. And it's it's not it's not that's not inconceivable to do. Yeah, it's not it's not like you guys are in your twenties or early thirties where the responsibility levels aren't are very different. You can just yeah. you can kinda I mean, go, Hey, I'm out of here. Honest, yeah. When I was at that age and we had some of those tours, I just quit my job. I'm not, yeah. I'm not advocating quitting your job. Stay in school. Don't do drugs. You know, that's but right. I did because that's where my focus was. I mean, you know, who cares about working at Dollar General? I just you get another one. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you can't do that kind of stuff now, especially you know, you got the house, you got the car, you know, you got to mow the yard, you know, or pay somebody to do it. You know. I got a question for you. What uh, you have good relate? You said your parents were really cool. You got a good relationship with them, I'm assuming. Oh, they sure. still, yeah, definitely. They're still alive. Yeah, yeah. So, how how do they feel now about like was there ever times where there was tension where they were like, "You got to get a real job. You got to do something." You know, no, 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 they've always supported you. Hell no! I remember my first uh, PV stack. It was a PV twelve combo with a four speaker cab extension, and uh, yeah, my stepfather at the time was like. It, well, you got to remember, we were living on the farm, and he pulled up in the truck, and he came and said, hey, I need you to get that uh, feed out of the back of the truck. I'm like, oh, fuck. Okay. You know, I'm expecting to go out there and have to lug a bunch of feed. Well, I go down there and put down the tailgate, and that combo with the extension cab is just laying in the bed of the truck. Wow. Nice. Like, Hi, I got you. Enjoy. So you they're, know, like that. they're pretty proud of what you've achieved then, I assume. And in the early days, they would they were there at the shows, too, during the early days. That's right? cool. That's so, cool. Yeah, I, I imagine. I'm very lucky in that respect. Yeah, you are. I mean, because, like, I, I think most I think most parents would be, you know, I, I think they most parents would kind of be like, well, just have a plan B. Just have a plan B. Right. But sometimes there is no plan B. You just, you know, you, you roll – the dice and you go and you've had a pretty solid career which i i want to touch on a few of those things so 
you've done. Let's hit the candle mass thing and we'll talk about tyrant and then I'll let you get out of here. Um, and, and you can we can talk about the other quick quick hitters and you can give a quick update on anything you got going on. What um the candle mass thing, like how did that come about? Because now that's 2007. Was, was that's that right when we were doing alone? Right, right in that time. We were right. Working, we were working on we were working on it, buttoning it up or something. And so I mean that's kind of a funny story in itself. And if I, I'll give you the short version. Okay, so I'm sitting at work doing my cubicle job you know and uh i get a phone call and it's like uh hey do you know uh messiah quit candle mass again i'm going yeah and what do you what what do you, what do you want me to do about it no they're looking for a new singer i'm like well that's cool and let them you know i you know what what am i supposed to say and they're like pushing me like you should do it i'm like uh, this guy's in the band or who was who was telling you this no a friend of mine right and uh so I'm like, no, nah. I said, dude, I'm kind of in SA and we're kind of like recording alone right now. I mean, I'm like literally going to the studio tonight to work. Yeah, alone. right, 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 right. Yeah. And they're like, no, 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 you need to do it. I'm like, well, that's fine. And they're like, uh, I was sending the email to Leif. I said, knock yourself out. And uh, I think it was that evening uh, Leif responded and said, hey, that'd be great, man. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. So I'm finishing up alone. I'm, I'm making all this really compact. I mean, there's I a get, lot. I get it. Yeah, yeah. So we're finishing up alone, and I'm going to say, Jesus, in a couple of months, I'm in the same studio in the same booth recording King of the Crowns. Wow. Yeah. So wow. That's kind of how it happened. I did do my obligatory um, audition with uh, Solitude. That, how apropos is that? The, the song yeah. I want from Candle Mass to do my audition. You just sent you just sent them tracks or something. Or they what? sent me. They had a live version that they had recorded for me to sing to. So it was it was the updated version that I got in two thousand seven, and it was just real rough, but it didn't make a shit to me because I don't I don't need a bunch of shit when I record anyway. So was, and I just sang Solitude on it and sent it back. And they're like, all right, uh, yeah. So uh, we talked to uh, Gary at Nomad, and you know, Oli's uh, going to take care of the rest of it. And I'm um, next time and they're recording uh, Demonia Six. That was the first one I did for King of the Gray Islands. Yeah. yeah. How were how were the guys in in SA about it? Were they cool or were they upset? Oh, that's, that's the whole thing, man. Everybody's so supportive of each other. Because even Tom John was fiddling around with the uh, uh, God damn, Liquid Sound Company. You know, and everybody's doing things, and it's like, that's fucking cool, man. You know, we're thinking, yeah, that'd be cool, man, and yada, yada. And so there was not, never an issue. Um, you know, we still played, and I'd, I'd go do something with CMAS and come back, and we still did, had a couple of shows during that time. And there was actually one point in time where we did Solitude did a show overseas. I was already overseas, Candle Mass. And so there was uh, some Romanian promoter was trying to set up some some Romanian festival. And uh, since we were both there, SA was going to headline Friday and Candlemas was going to headline Saturday. Wow. Which I was saying, that's going to be cool as shit because I was going to do yeah. both. You know, yeah. Friday, Candlemas Saturday. Well, what, I don't know what happened with the promoter. Again, I don't care about shit like that. That's what Oli's for, Oli Bang. Uh-huh. It, it fell through. but Fell out. Yeah. So I mean, there, there. My point is, there was never any, any issue with anybody or anything. Now, how always, were, how were the shows? How was the? Uh, I mean, look, as big as SA is, Candlemas is often thought of along with Trouble, leaving Sabbath out of it because we know Sabbath started Doom, but they're that's kind of a, a different animal, right? They were the proto Doom band, right? Yeah, right. Um, but, but, you know, you got the Obsessed, you got St. Vitus, you got, you know, those bands too are in there. But, you know, what was it like to think, wow, man, I'm, I'm in fucking candle mass. Like, and I have to say, I love all those. I love almost every candle mass album. Right. But I struggle sometimes when people say, what's your favorite candle mass? I, I automatically want to say Nightfall or Epicus, but. 
I'm not gonna lie to you, man. King of the Grey Islands is so fucking good, dude. Like, I just love that album, man. And and you know, um, I'm not. I hope I don't fuck this up. Ble Bleeding Baroness is on there, right? No, uh, Bleeding oh, Baroness is on. Is Death that on Death Doom? Death Magic Doom. Oh wait, and I'm mixing them up. So you you're liking Death Magic Doom, right? I like Death Magic Doom. So the yes. Bleeding Baroness and the Hammer of Doom and yeah, yeah, Mad Queen Bee. Well, wait, where was is Lucifer Rising on? King, that was this. That was a that was a, like an EP type of thing. Yeah, there's a little single. Yeah, so we yeah we had the full albums, but there are a lot of EPs that we did. You know, I mean like, uh, yeah, we did a couple of EPs. We did you know Don't Fear the Reaper, All Along the Watchtower, Lucifer Rising was on one. Then we had another little four song EP where we redid Demon's Gate and had three other new ones. So there's a lot of stuff out there, man. Oh, uh, dude, there's so many good songs. I mean. Bleeding Baroness, man, that might be one of your best vocals ever, man. Just <laughs> I, that chorus is so fucking killer, dude. Thank you. I used to play that in a. I was a manager of a of a retail store, and I would I right. would crank that shit late at night, and I'd be like back there going the Bleeding Baroness, and like all my work, all my workers would be like, "There's something wrong with you, man." Yeah, no, he was just, what the fuck? <laughs> What's wrong with this dude? Like, and they'd be like. I would play like autopsy and all kind of weird shit, but man, that was one of my favorite albums to play. I man, that is good, good stuff, Robert. As good as SA is, and I love the SA stuff. I really love the work that you did with I think Leif was in a really good spot writing. He really kind of connected what with was you. Some solid material on those, you know, fucking son. Uh, yeah, I mean, King of the Grey always got some stuff on there too, or even not on there, like Edgar Gray. And a lot of the the, the heavier stuff, um, you know, uh, I hate I hate this. I get fifty thousand songs in my head, and then I can't. Yeah, I'm I'm remembering. I'm really misremembering what's on there. It's stupid. Um, here we go. Try because I, I I feel stupid that I pulled out names that weren't on the. Uh, hey, I do it all the time. <laughs> there we go. All right, because I mean, uh, where's that? Come on now. How comes I can't find? Here we go. Because that was the first one, right? What? Yeah. Uh, that was your Brown? first album. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's got Emperor of the Void. Oh, that's Killer Devil Seed. Oh, see, that's a, see, that's a good one too. Man of Shadows is on there. Uh, Opal City, uh, Embracing the Sticks. That that one I really like embracing. Demonia six, like you said, of stars of stars and smoke. Man, these are all killer. You know, it's Leif, man. Leif is just the king of the fucking riff, like John right. Perez, right? right? Um, what any really cool experiences jump out at you, like from that era of your your career when you're with Candlemass? Anything jump out at you, like as really mind blowing? Uh, I I would I would have to say. Well, it would have to have been the Sweden Rock Festival. That was, you know, uh, the first time, I guess, that I played to such a magnitude of people. And, and I mean, I've, I've done a lot of those type of festivals like Bakken and, and uh, what is it, Bang Your Head down in Bolingen. Um, Ham Hammer, Doom, Doom of Hammer. You know, Bakken, kind of, Hellfest. Yeah, Bakken, done those. But Sweden Rock was definitely a wow. Uh, you know that was that was cool, and then you know like Hellfest, Hellfest was good. It, yeah, it was just um, it was all really, you know, just like wow, okay, this, this is it, man. This is cool. Well, here's a question for you: When you play a giant festival like that, and, and I mean, you know, Hell's was thirty five hundred people. That's a lot of people to play in front of. But you know, you go to Hellfest, you're probably playing in front of thirty, forty, maybe fifty. I don't even know sixty. Yeah. Right, I mean, Maiden it's probably crazy. Maiden yeah. probably had ninety thousand. It just goes on forever, right? Yeah. How how is that? Do you ever? First of all, do you ever get nerves going out on the stage? Do you ever do get I? like? No. no. Okay. Did you no, ever? I, straight up facts or facts? I don't. Did you like early on when you first started doing it, or no? no. You don't have anxiety like that at all because mm -hmm. you seem like a low sort of chill dude, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I just I. People will ask, how do you get prepared? I just say, I put my boots on. 
I now, did you, did you drink back in the day at all, like before you go out, or? Of course we did. Yeah. 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 Not fall down drunk, but of course. Right, right. We were involved, you know. We had the obligatory huddle with a shot, you know. I just, you know, it's rock and roll, man. Don't be a pussy. <laughs> it's rock and roll. I told you, I only played on top of my house. Yeah. But I jammed the stereo. Come on, man. Let yeah, me live awesome. through you just a tiny little bit, Rob. Well, I, you still got to hang on to those vibes, man. But, uh, yeah, nothing stupid, you know. But, uh, yeah, of course it was. And um, I, I, had, I was going somewhere with that, but I guess I'm not. Well, so, okay, so the, the question tied in with the – before I got into the anxiety thing was, is it – how is it for you playing to a small room where there's 300, 400 people versus going out in front of 40,000 people? Is it all the same to you? Uh, well, however you want to take it to me, it's all the same. I don't treat it any different. And okay. I know you sound like a cliche answer, but I don't give a fuck. If, if, if 10 people came to see the show, whatever that show may be, they get as much as 70,000. Okay. And that goes right back to the DNA, my essence, you know? Yeah. It's, it's you appreciate. I mean, you got to realize these people that come to these things, whether it's the 10 people at, you know, Billy Bob's, or the 70,000 at Sweden Rock Hellfest, people spend their money. They make an effort to go. A lot of them travel. Yeah. You you owe them a good time, man. We're, you know, like Gretchen Wilson. I'm here for the party. You know, that's that's what that's what we do. We provide that for that escapism because I want the same damn thing. If I'm going yeah. to a show. You don't want to see a half-ass effort. I don't want a half-ass effort, and I'm there for the escapism to go and if you know whatever you get wasted and you're with your buddies and whatnot and it's just like you know you get that emotion when you hear the first couple of beats of that one song you've been waiting for all night long and get yeah you're like, yeah fuck, yeah fuck, you know, fuck yeah you know that's what you do i yeah i'm still a fanboy myself man sure that's and you know what you can't lose that, man, because if you lose that, you might as well get out of the game, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. that's the whole reason. Yeah, you're getting you're getting the you're getting you're getting the I'll get you out of here in a couple minutes, Rob. Um, so I wanted to ask you, I had um I had Greg May on a couple months back, I want to say like September or so, and we were going through their discography. We we're going, you know, we went through the first two albums and then or the first three albums, excuse me, and then I found out that you sang on hereafter <laughs> yeah and i was like wait what wait what rob's on that what the hell man so i'm talking to greg and he's like yeah he's like well you know i just wanted that we always had you know his brother greg i guess yeah. or not greg. 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 greg's the bass player glenn. What is it? Glenn. glenn glenn that's it glenn yeah was the original singer yeah and on the first two albums, and then they, I think someone else came in for album three, or was Glenn on that one too? Don't give me a line. I don't, yeah, I, don't I can't know. remember. But then you came in, and um, man, I gotta tell you, I, I love that first album. I'm not the second album's kind of weird. It the vocalizations are so all over the map, I can't can't get my head around it. It's almost too, in. yeah, it's just too strange. But um we get to here and after, and it's man, it's a great fucking album. It's a really good album. What? Well, how that? How that all come together? Iron here after. I mean, again, I was like, it's got, it's solid. It's got solid material on there, man. Oh yeah, Rocky is that the guitar player's name? Yeah, Rocky. Rocky's pretty. Rocky's a pretty killer player, man. I mean, uh, Greg and Rocky have been there from the get go. You know. Yeah. And they had Ron on the drums, and he's a great dude. How'd yeah. you end up being drawn into that? What was did Greg just reach out to you or what? I mean, pretty much, yeah. I was living in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. At, well, not really Phoenix, but Phoenix, Arizona at the time, and I was out in the garage working on something, you know, phone call or text or something. Hey, I was Greg tired, and yeah, what's up, man? You doing anything? Yeah, I'm working on the car, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's basically how it started. No way. Similar. Did something like that. Did Maybe you, you I did was a couple. Eggs out. I don't know. Did you do a show? I think you did a couple shows with him, right? Yeah, we did. We did uh, Fire and Ice in Ventura yeah. with uh, Sarah Thungle. That was the whole Sarah Thungle thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then we did one up in 
New York, New York City, and uh, hell, maybe maybe there was only two. Yeah, I I kind of think he did say there was only two shows. I'm not yeah, sure because why. that bullshit COVID crap they threw at us. Yeah, thing up, man. Yeah, I mean we there was a couple of uh, festivals we were gonna do on the east side, and uh, it just didn't happen. Did you enjoy that experience working on that album? That oh, was great, man. Um, stayed at Bill Matoyer's house for two weeks, and oh, that's right, Matoyer yeah. did the production on that. I forgot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So flew out to Cali, went over there first night. We all hung out, met. I stayed at Bill's house. I didn't see Tyron for the next two weeks. <laughs> it was just me. Oh, and really? Oh, um, yeah. Tell me a little bit real quick about some of the other things you got going on. Like um, Grief Collector, you were you did two albums with here fairly recently. And that's, you know, I didn't know about them. I checked them out. It's pretty fucking good stuff. Where are they out of? Minnesota. Okay. Really good band, that. man. Yeah. No, I was uh, I was approached for that. And um, he submitted su submitted some material. It sounds like it's like to submit the AO five one two form. You know, he submitted right, the right, material. Right, 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 right. And I was like, I was talking to my manager Anita. I was like, fuck, man. I said I'm digging this shit. Let's let's do it. Yeah. So she set all that up, and so it wasn't guys you knew. They just reached out to you oh, then. I didn't know him from Adam. Yeah. You, know? you get a lot of you get approached a lot, Robert, about projects seems like it oh yeah 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 i mean um uh yeah all the time let's see i got what do we got here i actually pulled this up uh, you know can you still hear me or see me oh yeah i can see you mm -hmm. yeah i mean uh, i did a project with lucid dreaming uh paradigmata the, the andy uh dj somina album the Sicatura ad astra which that one just dropped uh, Lost Requiem, Alien Athe or Atheist, Atheist Alien, you know. Wow. Like, yeah, just um, got did projects, and if you know they, I know it sounds horrible. If they, when they submit their material, it's like that. Ah, fuck yeah, man! I can I can see myself singing on that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, it's hired gun studio work and. With uh, Andy, it was a full album. A lot of these ones are one or two, you know. Tracks or something. Yeah, yeah. one or two tracks, you know. Like Do you that. have a studio at the house there? Uh, no, no. I go to uh, Blackout okay. Studio, Texas. And um, that's where I do, do the things around here. So, yeah, I just hired a gun for that stuff. And then, you know, Aunt, me and Andy had been talking for quite a while, actually. I did, uh, did something for him back in uh, 14. The lyric, he had a lyrica project where he had a bunch of vocalists on it, and I did that. And then he ended up wanting to do a full album, and asked if I was interested, and so I did that. Man, so that's a lot of hired gun stuff, and I don't mind. I, I love it because the music that's presented to me is definitely something I would either have wrote and or would like to perform on. Well, the nice thing is too. You get a paycheck, and you don't necessarily have to go out and slog around on the road if you don't want to. If you just want to yeah. be lending your voice to to projects and whatnot i mean yeah there's a couple of those it's guys out there to be asked you know i mean Jesus yeah Christ, yeah. You know? yeah it is it's an honor it's like well, no shit you yeah all right cool let's do it i mean some of those labels have guys like that you know that guy dino jalusic 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 or whatever I'm not you know who that. that is no he um he joined uh uh white snake there uh, towards the end was playing keyboards, but he was also backing up Coverdale because Coverdale's voice was starting to, he was starting to falter. This dude sounds like prime David Coverdale burn era. I mean, he's oh, just, man. Really burn? oh, he's fucking amazing, oh, man. <laughs> but he is Frontier's go-to guy. So he's got like 8 million albums out there. Right. He's getting a really nice paycheck and he doesn't have to go out on the road and not that you wouldn't, because you said you would like to go out on the road at this situation. Right, I go out tomorrow, man. Yeah. Make the numbers right and the offer good. Like I said, how do you prepare? Put my boots on. So yeah. Just put my boots on. Let's go. I'm, I got that old, you know, redneck hick. Fuck it. Let's do it. Fuck it. Let's do it. Hold my beer. Let's go. You know? <laughs> 
Well, I'm working on a solo album. I might be calling you for some vocals at some there point in time, right, like a track or something like that. It's, uh, there you go. Like, it's kind of like a prog doom album. It's got a little bit more proggy. Uh, then, well, I gather I did Gather in Darkness that project. I don't know. That, that, no, I don't know that. Who's that? Who's behind that? It's a guy Mike. I knew he's done a couple of things, but this was when I was in Houston, and uh, we did a project called Gather in Darkness, which is like super fucking. I did, it was just doom prog. I don't know how else to call it. I mean, it yeah, was mine's like, kind of like uh, mine's kind of like a heavier, darker Fates Warning sort of vibe to it. Okay, I got you. See, this was like Dream Theater meets trouble it was a hell of a mashup yeah that's that's an interesting combo yeah. i mean i like dream theater i like the early dream theater i, I kind of we'll see what happens with portnoy back maybe they maybe they come back i but they were they kind of lost me there mid later where it was just a lot of wanking it just the wanking yeah, I, am, I you know i was never really a true fan but uh yeah. But like I said, you know, I'm not opposed to doing something if it's good. And like that, that little mix of doom, I wrote a couple of tunes for that Gather in Darkness thing, which I mean, honestly, if you listen to it, you, you, you know who wrote what. <laughs> oh, okay. Right, right, right. Yeah. All right, man. I'm going to let you go. A couple quick hitters. Um, is there any chance at this point, do you think, and maybe you can't really answer it, maybe it's just who knows, never say never, but. Do you think there will ever be another full-on studio Solitude Eternus album? Does it matter at this point to you guys? Or is it something that maybe doing these live gigs might start the creative juices rolling again? To, to, so there you go. That's the whole thing. Um, wait and see. Yeah, I mean, that sounds harsh, but yeah, now, in all honesty, does anybody really want anything new? Or do, you know, at the festivals, you know, I mean, do you want the old stuff? Do you want new stuff? It, it, you can't judge that. It's a hard thing to uh, figure on. So this really is kind of a, you know, just eyeball the situation and see where it takes us. Because all of us, I would have to say, or feel pretty strongly about this gathering of the, S the SA guys again. Right. But on that note, there is, um, now this is a blatant promotion, but... Uh, we are actively working on Concept of God stuff at the moment. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that real quick, because that's one I'm not familiar with. Well, the Concept of God, I'll give you the short version. Uh, for whatever reason, John was like, hey, I want to take a hiatus. And uh, me, Covington, and Mosley were like, fuck that, we're still going to play. So we put together Concept of God and recorded an album. <laughs> and that was it. So you're going to have to listen to Concept of God. Seriously, man. There's some good stuff on there. Is that out? That came out, right? That's been out, yeah. Yeah, it's been yeah. out since like oh nine. Okay, the I miss, I missed that. It's called uh, the album's called Visions. Okay, I will I will dig that up. My I apologies. Don't think I you'll be disappointed. I'm sure I won't. I, I mean, there's I I've never heard you sing on anything that I'm disappointed in. So I mean, there's no you know, and I don't mean that. Like I'm not a stroker. I'm not that dude. Like like no so, no no. no it's, bands it's, it's, I appreciate it. My favorite band is Rush. Rush has a couple shitty albums, you know, right? right? Yeah, but you know, with their there, there's going to be a few with all the albums they put out over the years, right? And they were always boldly trying to change their sound and do different things and incorporate different things. Yeah, see, but I'm, that's a solid go-to man. That's a that's a core group of guys. That's somebody you want to emulate or, or people like that if you're an aspiring musician. Do you have a favorite Rush album? Uh the what? God damn it! The one with Spirit of the Radio. Permanent Waves? Yeah. Big, big, yeah. That, my that sec really my second show, Rob, was was Permanent Waves in Houston. It was the last show I saw there. I saw two shows before we moved. Uh, for Permanent Waves, Max Webster opened with Kim Mitchell. Yeah. Is that what you're about to? Yeah. yeah. Kim yeah. Mitchell, they were still Max Webster. Amazing band. But, I mean, they did. This was when they were still wearing the kimonos. You know, they were still oh. doing the, and they did all of 2112 with. I had forgot about that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, Alex's ball shot. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, but, you know, I've seen Rush uh, 56 times or something. And, Jesus. you know, yeah, I was a little upset. I'm pretty sure I bought one of Getty's, I don't know, one of his super expensive baseballs with my own contribution or whatever. But, um right. You know, just great guys. Got to meet him in 2007. That was kind oh, of, yeah. oh, man, dude, that was one of those days where I was just like, 
I was floating about six feet off the ground. Like I was hovering. Yeah, you know? that's, it that's, just didn't seem real. Royalty right there, man. Well, you know, you know this, man. Like you said, you're a fan too. Yeah, and you know, back in the seventies, these guys were like gods, man. They weren't like real human beings. No, they were, you thought they lived on Olympus somewhere. They just weren't oh, real, sure. right? Yeah, right. I mean, so, they the Great White North. You know, I mean, <laughs> exactly. But I wanted to end on this because I thought this was really cool. Shrikova, where are you at? She was at. She saw you there at. Um, met Robert during the. The Candlemas show, and I started crying in front of him. Do you remember that? I sure do. Yeah, yeah. She, uh, great fans. I mean, I love people like that, or, you know, you don't get them that much, you know. And I believe she came all the way from, God damn it, I'm going to get wrong, Brazil. Really? Brazil? Are you, Shrikova, are you from Brazil or Japan or where are you from, real quick? Tell us, real quick. Here. Uh, so stupid. Yeah, man, oh, look. James. I'm sorry. Wait. Who is it? it What'd you say? Uh, Sorry. I'm all I'm lost now. Anyway, she'll, she'll but tell, she'll tell us here in a sec. Go ahead. Who me? No, I don't, not, no, not no, her. She's coming up. Yeah. Um, did you? That's a good question. Shakova has. Did you ever think about doing a solo album? I, I hear we're working on it. Disciple of Doom. Oh, Disciples of Doom. That's it. Disciple. Oh, Disciple. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, definitely going to be a project. Are you, is it something you've got tracked already or tracking going on or what? It's uh, stuff that's been in my head for 250 years. Yeah, I know that feeling. And bits man. and pieces of it, you know, come out in solitude. Bits and pieces of it come out in Concept of God. Bits and pieces come out and gather in darkness. We're going to put all those pieces together. That's awesome, man. Well, I'll definitely check that. I definitely will check out Concept of God. Um, anything else you want to plug? Robert, I, and first of all, I want to thank you, man. I want to thank you for as uh, the you know the time you gave me today. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to meet you and and kind of connect the dots on some of the stuff. And I do apologize for coming late to the party, but I'm hard in, so you know it's not. Uh, thank you. I mean, any time is good time. She's from Chile. Chile, God, name yeah. it. Hey, yeah, sorry close, about that. Close to Brazil, yeah. Yeah. Um, real quick, couple con one of the best concert memories I have seeing Solitude. Bayou Club in Georgetown, Washington, for the second album, bought the Silver Cross, sold at the shows. Yeah, we had. Uh, I'd hold on to that if, if you still have it because we we I, I actually we actually made those in the machine shop. We owned a machine shop in Boyd, Texas, and um, we actually made those. I actually made those at the machine shop on like a bridgeport mill and wow and, and then we sent them out to get anodized and everything else you know so i i don't know that if you got it because that was it <laughs> that you, was do not you have one? do you have one i don't even have one yeah you know, i know that funny like i i find it so weird sometimes when i talk to recording artists i was talking to a, a friend of mine brendan and uh, he's in a band called alters down in in new zealand and he does a side project called Grie uh, it's called Convulsing. And they just put out Meteor Gem just put out a an 80, just 80 albums. That's it. Super fancy variant with an OB strip and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. I saw it go up and I grabbed it right away. I don't know what it was, 40, 45, you know. Vinyl's out of control now. They're ripping us fans off again, but you know, that's how the system works. Yeah. But I, but I like having the cool stuff. And long story short, I sent him a picture of it. I said, hey, I just grabbed one. He's, he's like, good on you, mate. I'll, I'll never see one of those. I'm like, well, fuck, dude. I'll just grab you one. He's like, nah, I don't want to make you do that. I'm like, dude, I'll grab you one. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, but I mean, it's just weird to me that the artist doesn't get one. This is so strange. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's an assumption and it's an assumption I always had. But now, you know, now I'm on the other side of the fence. It's like, well, first of all, I made those damn crosses and I still don't have one. That's funny, man. Yeah. Well, listen, everybody, go out and check out. I got tons of uh, links in the description for Robert's projects. Um, I'll probably add a couple if I can find. Um, let me see. Well, I'll, I'll check afterwards, but I'll try to find uh, some of the concept of God stuff, maybe link that in there so people go check that out. And uh, let's hope, I'm going to be honest, let's just hope there's some more SA gigs. Well, I know there's. 
we can only do some shows. Like I yeah. said, just where's the offers and we'll uh, go from there. But I think you I think it's fair to say it's unlikely you're gonna get in an Econa line and drive around the states again, right? That's unlikely, right? No, no, we're gonna go up to the extended cab, you know, Ford two fifty diesel. Woo! With a nice bed in the bed. A yeah. bed in the bed for a, yeah, a camper on this some bitch, you know? Yeah. Um yeah, man. I, I this has been a real thrill to hang out with you, Robert. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the interview. And uh hang on one second here. Uh everybody go to the links in there. Oh Buy I'm stuff. sorry, I'm I meant to say chili. I did. He did. I could tell. It's all that vodka he was drinking tonight. Guys, by the way, he didn't drink. I did. I had one beer. <laughs> I had one beer and I'm already half tanked. I'll show you how how lame of a drinker I am anymore. It just didn't not something as an old well, man. Cheers, man. cheers to you. Same wow. to you, brother. Hang on one sec, Robert, will you? Thanks, everybody. Oh, real quick, one one quick uh show note. Uh Tuesday night, 9 30 p.m. We're doing an interview with Phil Tugas. Phil is in Worm, Cathealist, First Fracture. Oh, God. Uh, Atramentus. I think he's uh, he's in like 14 different bands. He's just an amazing, insane guitar player. So Phil's going to be joining me 930 on Tuesday night. And crossing my fingers, but I think I've got Chris Reifert locked up for later in the week then. Um, and that's that one's been brewing for a while. So, uh, also we're going to do a uh, glam metal island sometime this month, uh, later in the month. We'll, we'll be doing that. So, uh, Rob, hang on one sec. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right.